John. Oh, yeah, great. Listen, I know politicians love hearing the sound of their own voice, right? But today, Mr. Stianazen, you're going to shut up and listen. <laughs> you know where that's where from. Where have I heard that before? Yeah, where have you heard that before? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you tell us. It was from the president um, when I kept interrupting him in parliament when he was talking nonsense. So, I mean, I've actually got the clip. Mm. Let me just pull it up. Sorry, I know we're getting straight into mm. this. There's actually a very uh, well-known song now about it, uh, Gormix. Gormix? Still, yeah, I'm still waiting for my, my royalties from it. But, uh, <laughs> okay, so this, this is the clip here, right? <laughs> I mean, this thing's iconic. You look at Brazil, you look at a number of countries in Southeast Asia, and shut up, you stay nice and, and listen. You look around the world. Order, I want you to shut up. Order. I really order. do want you to honorable shut up. President. Why are you rising, Honorable Stenazen? You're looking Nathan? pretty sharp there. Uh, hey? House the Honorable President told me to shut up. Yeah. I'd like him to answer. But shut up is unparliamentary. And if you're gonna if you're gonna hurl EFF members out for telling him for deliberately leaving the, house, President, the rule must apply to him. He must please. withdraw. So I mean, can you give us some context behind that clip? Yeah, we were talking absolute nonsense about minimum wage. Uh, it has destroyed economies uh, in many many parts of the world. And the examples that he was using, I kept saying failing economy, failing economy, failing economy, and he didn't like it. And the president's got an exceptionally thin skin. But, you know, that is the whole point of, of what heckling in Parliament is supposed to do. You're supposed to really get under the person's skin. And it's an art in Parliament to ignore the heckling and to focus on delivering your speech because what it did was threw him off completely off his message, and uh, which is what you want to do when, when somebody's rattling away at the podium. So, I mean, is that what Parliament is always like? Because I generally, I'm not a huge, and I just want to start off this interview by saying, I know very little about politics, <laughs> right? And I know that can sometimes be dangerous when you're bringing on politicians. And I'm not saying necessarily in your case, but a lot of the time um, politicians get interviewed by people that can't push back enough, right? Mm. Well, I've never had that problem. <laughs> what, getting pushed back? Yes. You get pushed back a lot. <laughs> well, I do quite uh, hectic interviews, Stephen Sacco and, and others. It's the one on Hard, hard Talk. Hard Talk and others, yeah. So it's, uh, I'm used to tough interviews, so push back. But I mean, with, with this, right, mm. is Parliament always like this? Or do you guys actually get stuff done? Well, I think that uh, what you're watching on TV and in a clip like that is literally 10% of the work. The majority of the work of Parliament happens in the committees and behind closed doors. And often a lot of work is done in the pub uh, and deals are done, etc. cetera, there. Uh, but there's a high degree of consensus actually in, pol in Parliament. Um, and to make a place like Parliament work, there has to be a relatively high degree of consensus between parties, which is what the chief whips do and, and the whips and the caucus leadership um, are managing the processes. So what you watch on TV is generally the floor show. And obviously people have to play to their bases and play to the gallery and to get their message out there because everybody's watching. And Parliaments around the world are robust like that. You can watch the House of Commons, you can watch the US Congress, you can watch the Indian Parliament and for entertainment value, the Taiwanese Parliament as well, where there's often I've seen, ups I've seen there's like, <laughs> I think it was exactly what you just said, or was the Japanese <laughs> Parliament or something where you have to fight to stay on the stands and your whole basically uh, uh, yeah. so group, parliament, they parliament, like fight for position. Yeah, Parliament's a robust place and politics, as I've always said, is a contact sport. And, you know, it, it's robust and you've got to have a thick skin. Something the president hasn't developed uh, particularly well. I mean, he takes great offense quite easily, which is a remarkable for someone who leads, uh, you know, the largest political party for now in mm. South Africa. But there it is. I think he's far more used to sitting in boardrooms where you've got, you know, people who sit around the table nodding their head as you speak rather than being used to a robust environment like parliament where, where I've certainly spent the last 15 years of my life. What he was saying about the minimum wage um, was completely ignoring the fact that it was going to lead to massive job losses in the agricultural sector, which it now has. It was going to lead to a contraction of employment, which it now has. And we were just pointing out those points to him. And obviously, he didn't like the truth being said to him because you know, it's much easier to make these you know, government by announcement things about a minimum wage without doing the real work of what the intended versus the unintended consequences would be uh, if it were to be applied. And is the employment rate higher in Cape Town than it is in places like 
Joburg and Durban. Yes, and that's a function of the growing economy. So 98% of net new jobs were created in the last quarter in the Western Cape, 368,000 jobs that are created because the economy is growing here. Because we don't talk about growing an economy, we get on and do it. You cut the red tape, you attract investment, you put a high price on and focus on infrastructure because infrastructure, water, sanitation, roads, electricity are the backbone of economic growth. And that is why the economy is growing here. It's why more people are employed here and why you have a better chance of finding a job here than in anywhere else in the country. When I go into places like uh, Danoon, for example, I see cables running everywhere um, and I don't see the infrastructure. Mm. So, I mean, where is that infrastructure? And I kind of want to get on this a little bit later as well, but people always say Cape Town is so beautiful and you guys have done a really good job at running the city, right? Mm. But as soon as I leave that little circumference around Cape Town CBD, and Cape Town is by far the nicest city Mm. in South Africa. It's beautiful, right? But when I leave the outskirts of Cape Town, um, even 15 Ks, right? Mm. I see um, shacks everywhere, townships growing at a rapid rate. Mm. And um, it just doesn't seem like, it, it kind of seems like let's keep this little bubble that everyone sees really nice and just forget about the rest. Mm. Well, I don't think that's true uh, in terms of the focus of the party. I think it is true when it comes to the legacy of apartheid era spatial planning that every city in the country and every urban area is grappling with. And so, yes, I mean, Kai Leach is not going to look like Camps Bay um, at the, because there's so much of a backlog that you've got to deal with. Um, but then you're not comparing apples with apples. You should be comparing Kai Leach with Kwamashu in Durban or Alex in Johannesburg. And certainly if you look at government's own reports, the Universal um, Household Access to Basic Services report, not done by the DA, it's done by national government, the access to electricity, water, and sanitation in the Western Cape, in all sectors, including those townships that you mentioned, are in in the upper ninety percent. So you're uh, saying ninety percent of people yes, have access so, to it. Yeah, so they have access to running water, to sanitation, to electricity. But now there are a lot of developments, particularly informal settlements, that are taking place on private land. The city can't put infrastructure in on land that doesn't belong to it. And if one looks uh, alongside the N2 and large parts of some of those areas that you speak about, a lot of that is encroaching on private land and Philippi as well. It's private land. The city, and some of it is completely unsuitable for housing settlement, yeah. um, you know, which is why you have those terrible issues with flooding and because a lot of those properties are on floodplains. There's a reason they're not developed. The city can't go in and fix you know, and provide services on land that doesn't belong to it or in which... But it can't be free, free old title. But the city spends 75% of its budget on rolling out services to previously disadvantaged areas. So this notion that the city spends all of its budget in Camps Bay and Constantia is not borne out by the facts. Joseph Biden said famously, don't tell me what your priorities are. Show me your budget and I'll tell you what your priorities are. I encourage anybody to go onto the Cape Town's website open the budget, the capital and operational budgets, and have a look at where the money is actually being spent. It's not in the Constantias and the camp space. It's in those areas where we're trying to improve service delivery. Are we there yet? Does Kailicha look like Constantia yet? Absolutely not. We've got a long way to go. But certainly we're far further along the road than any other metropolitan area in the country that is dealing with the same legacy of apartheid era spatial planning. Yeah. I want to talk about this a little bit more just mm. now, but... I want to go back to Cyril, right? Mm. Do you think he's done a good job at leading the country? No, I think he's done an appalling job of leading the country because one of the biggest tests of leadership is whether you have the power to stand up, not to your enemies, but to your own associates. So I think he, I don't think he's done a good job at all. I think he's made a lot of promises. I think he's spoken a lot, but I think he's actually done very little. And if one objectively looks at the criteria that one would use to measure whether a country is moving forward or backwards... We're going backwards in every single one of them. The crime rate, economy, um, joblessness, um, access to services, uh, infrastructure, every one of those metrics is moving in the wrong direction. And so he spoke about the nine wasted years under Zuma, which he was the deputy president for. Um, But I think he's added another five wasted years to those years. I think we haven't moved forward 
as a country. And I think he's got to bear a lot of responsibility for that. And I mean, sorry, my back is really <laughs> killing me. I was on, I was at a wedding this weekend oh, and it's really dancing too much. Yeah, literally. Yeah. And I never dance. So, you know, I've actually got you a, Hello, as well. Okay. Chairs are a little bit stiff. Well, you know? I'm fine, thanks. Are you yeah. sure? You yeah, yeah, I'm absolutely yeah, fine. Just... <laughs> oh. uh, but wrong currency. These are euros. Oh. <laughs> These are euros, oh, no. not dollars. <laughs> you know what happened? You know what must have happened here? What? Cyril came over for a uh, sleepover last <laughs> weekend and he must have left his uh. pillow. <laughs> well, you know why he needs to put that into his pillows and mattress? It's because if you don't have a spine, <laughs> you need something to keep you upright. <laughs> something to keep you rigid. <laughs> So that's why you've got that stuff stuffed. Yeah, the sorry. I mean, I had no idea. I, mean, I hope I'm going to get to keep some of these. I mean, five euros is like what? That's like a million rand. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, talking about stuffing money in pillows, you know, actually I call them squirrel yeah. because yeah, squirrels hide their nuts in, in yeah. trees. You know, uh, Cyril hides his, yeah. his money in his couches. But um, well, I thought Indy Zed's got his nuts. Never mind. <laughs> <the couch. laughs> I, I wanted to know, right? Going, I want to talk about the incident with the, the money, the $4 million that was found in um, Cyril's couch. Can you just give us some context for the international viewers as to what happened there? Well, the president was found, uh, well, had a whole lot of money in foreign currency stuffed into a couch in his private residence. And, you know, if this had happened to, you know, Emmanuel Macron or to Joe Biden or to any other world leader, it would have been an international scandal. Um, first of all, you're not allowed to keep foreign currency in that amount. Secondly, the money had not entered mm. the country legally, and I've got that clearly from SARS. It was not declared. How was Harvard. it entered? Does anyone know? Nobody knows uh, yet because the South African Reserve Bank and the public protective weaseled out of their responsibilities to get to the bottom of that. That's precisely the things they should be asking. And now the Reserve Bank comes out with this so-called incomplete transaction. And the terrible precedent they've created now is that anybody can have foreign, large amounts of foreign currency and they can say, well, sorry, the transaction's not finished. I'll declare it when it's finished. It is a terrible precedent. And this is what happens when you have institutions of state contorting themselves into, into pretzels to protect one man. Um, the president could have dealt with the thing so easily. He could have come out right from the beginning and said, I'm sorry, it is wrong. I shouldn't have had this. I will declare it. I'll pay any fines. I'll pay any tax. I've been very busy trying to fight corruption and maladministration. And I think the country would have moved on. But it was the deception. The money got stolen, was not reported. To so that's finish. how people found out, yeah. right? It got stolen yeah. from his couch. Yeah, yeah, it got stolen from his couch. He didn't declare it. He didn't open a case with the police. Instead, he sent the presidential protection unit to go and recover his money, which itself is a conflict of interest between his duties as Ramaphosa, the president, and Ramaphosa, the businessman. You and I don't have a presidential protection unit that can go and recover money stolen from our homes, yet he had that that power because he was the president. That is an abuse of power and a conflict of interest, and it should never, ever have happened. Also, without a police um, case number, what basis do you cross borders and go and investigate, etc.? We still don't know how that money came into South Africa, what it was used for, what its intended purpose was, why it wasn't declared and put into a safe, you know, and like, and we still don't have those answers, and I don't think we ever will now, because our state institutions that should be getting to the bottom of these things have all weaselled out of their responsibilities, because they're terrified to upset the president. And do we know know who stole it? Well, they do know who stole it, um, but a lot of those guys have mysteriously disappeared. Uh, the the criminals. I mean, we've never had them. Why were they not called before the public protector? Why were they not called to before Saab, et cetera? Um, they were, some of them were paid off by uh, the presidential protection unit to keep quiet. They were paid hush money, never to talk about this again. This is not the behavior of an innocent law-abiding citizen. If you've got nothing to hide, why would you go to those lengths to conceal the theft and then conceal the persons responsible for the theft from coming to account for their story? Has, but has corruption just got to a point where it's so normal here that things like this can be like, uh, oopsie, yeah, well, $4 million I, I, in the couch, whoopsie, yeah. 62 million rand or whatever it is. Yeah, I think that South Africans have become immune to, to these things. And it is a terrible situation, however, this one particularly, because this is a man who should be setting the example. He, when he took his oath of office, said that he would uphold the constitution 
and all other law of the Republic. I think this is typified by the fact that the ANC killed the parliamentary inquiry. There was an independent panel of a retired uh, judge, Mosineki, and others who found that the president had a case to answer and that parliament should conduct an inquiry. What happened? Exactly like they did under Zuma, they voted that particular investigation down, just like they did with the Encandla one. So it's over. They're, they're no longer yes. investigating yeah, well, it. And the parliament will no longer investigate So he's just got away with it scot-free. Yeah, he's got away with it because he's used his majority in parliament to protect him from accountability. And that's why I say he's lost the moral compass now to be able to, to lead the fight against corruption and maladministration. I mean, w when it comes to Zuma rights, mm. what is happening with him right now? Well, he's got off scot-free. He's not, he's not in prison anymore. He's eh? not in prison anymore. He's facing 783 charges of fraud, corruption and racketeering and only as a result of the dogged persistence of the DA over the last 15 years to make sure he faces in day of his day in court, including having the ridiculous decisions by Mokhateri Mshe and, um, and others overturned for exonerating him. He will have his day in court on those. But I think there's been a terrible precedent set by releasing him now uh, in the way in which the president has done. Because in order to buy cover to release Zuma, he had to release thousands of, of convicted criminals at the same time. Uh, 9,000 criminals. Because he used what was called a special remission to get rid of Zuma. And ironically, it was just invented the day before Zuma was reporting to prison. Oh, that's a special coincidence. Remission. <laughs> But we have a 70% recidivism rate in this country, which means that 70% of people who are convicted and freed will reoffend. That means that, you know, there's potential... I actually, success. I heard it was 90%. No, well, uh, the figures I've got is an average of 70%, okay. which means that there's now 6,000 criminals on the street that will likely recommit the same or more violent crimes mm -hmm. than they were imprisoned for. So in order to buy cover for releasing Zuma... South Africans have now had the double insult of having 6,000 criminals, violent criminals, put back on the streets that are going to reoffend, And that is a terrible precedent. I mean, speaking about Zuma, you, you guys are both from KwaZulu-Natal, right? Correct. Um, were you there during the riots? Yes, I was. I, I flew the moment the riots broke out. I got onto an aeroplane and flew into Durban uh, to see for myself what was going on on the ground. And... Uh, you know, interacting with our people, there, our councillors there, trying to obviously assist communities and to try and convincing, to convince the president that, you know, you better do something because this thing's spiraling out of control rapidly. The police are not in control. They had run out of ammunition. They had run out of uh, rubber bullets. They had run out of uh, tear gas. They were begging, you know, private uh, gun shops, et cetera, to help them with ammo. And that. Uh, just a complete shambles. And to me, a very good indicator of how fragile our country still is and how easy and what in what a tinderbox we, we sit on um, and how important it is that you if we don't do something quickly to get the 30 million people who live below the poverty line in the country working to get our youth employment up you know we we could see scenes of that breaking out far more rapidly around the country in far more places I mean, I, I was there as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I'm from Cape Town, actually from Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. but I've been here pretty much my whole life. And mm -hmm. when I saw the riots break out, I also flew there. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, that must be one of the biggest disasters really to happen, not natural disasters, but disasters mm -hmm. to happen in South Africa in a long, long time. I mean, we've seen the fire now in, in Joburg, also a massive tragedy, mm -hmm. right? But um, when, I, when I saw the what was going on in, in Durban, I also flew down, I have family there. And I went to document it mm. and I was really shocked by what I saw. I mean, in, in Durban, right, my um, family lives in a small town and there's a little bridge there that mm. um, links them to the next town. And if that bridge wasn't there, they would have to drive 40 minutes to get around, mm. right? Mm. And that bridge broke a few years ago due to flooding mm. and it took about eight years to fix it. Mm. When they fixed it, it collapsed again. And eventually they, they fixed it now and it's, it's working again, right? But when I saw those riots and when I got there, people were uh, barricading the small towns, right? They, they had rifles on them. They had uh, AK-47s. Mm. They were ready to protect their, their, um, mm. their town, right? Uh, or their neighborhood. And um, the, I mean, the destruction that went on there was just immense. I mean, I don't know the figures, but I heard it was in the billions, right? Correct. 
How do you avoid something like that? How did something like that happen? Mm-hmm. Who was who was at fault? It was a breakdown in law and order, and the government was too slow to respond with task forces. And it started actually on the N3. When they allowed the trucks to be attacked for two days before any action was taken, it sent a very clear message that now's the time for us to act. And it spread like wildfire because there was no concomitant police action to to suppress it from happening. And then people saw the scenes of the looting and rioting and it encouraged more people who are who live at the periphery of the economy excluded from from opportunity to say, well now's my chance. You know, the TV I've always wanted or the plants I've always wanted, I'm just gonna go and take it. And and so it snowballed. And as it snowballed, the police lost even further control. And I remember the president um, called a Zoom meeting of the opposition leaders. And I said to Mr. President, I'm here on the ground. I said, whatever your advisors are telling you, it's not true. You need to get down here on the ground. I remember driving through Phoenix and seeing bodies on the side of the road. I went to go and visit families in Intezuma who had lost um, loved ones in the in the rioting. I went to go to Pantown to see the warehouses being burnt. Went up to Peter Maritzburg to go and look at the damage they'd done to... Uh, economic infrastructure. I mean, I was standing outside the macro two days later, the gas canisters were still firing off inside there from the heat. But the big thing was the police just withdrew from that whole situation. And what you saw was citizens having to defend and protect themselves. Which they did. Because the the law enforcement, you know, was just completely absent. And again, it goes to show just how broken our policing system is in South Africa. We still police in a Victorian way. Uh, We don't use technology. We don't use world advancements and policing science, and we don't use devolution, which gives greater power to local uh, and provincial governments to be able to determine police resources. There, they were waiting for instructions from Pretoria, you know, thousands of kilometers away from from the epicenter of where the problem was, and it can happen anywhere. I mean, we saw here in the Western Cape over the taxi. Um, I was just about to mention, uh, yeah, taxi rights there, but that was brought under control relatively quickly because... Relatively. <laughs> relatively. Because we have city law enforcement and who were able to step in uh, where the police had, had absolutely abrogated and in the case of the police minister sided openly with the lawbreakers rather than on the side of the commuters and law-abiding citizens. So was the taxi strike because you guys are putting on harsher regulations on the taxis? Was that the reason for it? No, the the, rea- the reality is that the city was implementing national legislation that has been on the statute book since 2018, passed by a vast majority of ANC MPs in parliament, and which the national department has instructed provinces to implement. There's no point having laws and regulations if they are let's sit idle on the books. Um, there was nothing out of the ordinary that the city was doing outside of the the enforcement that's provided for in terms of that national transport legislation. And clearly the Minister of Transport, Cindy Chikunga, has got no clue about what her own legislation is and was openly telling, you know, uh, telling the taxi operators and taxi drivers that she was instructing the city to ignore the laws. Now, if you have something called the rule of law in South Africa, it means that everyone abides by the rules, the regulations um, of the country. And that was why in both instances when this thing went to court, the judges sided with the city and the province because they said, but these guys are implementing the law. This is legislation. Uh, what you people are doing is is unlawful. It's outside of the law. And that's why the court ruled in the favor of the city and the province on both those occasions. Do you think the taxi union is the most powerful union in South Africa? I think they're one of the most powerful, and I think that they are uh, certainly behave in a way that is above the law. Um, I also don't think we get a full benefit of the cash and money that is flowing through those very lucrative businesses. If one looks at the revenue declaration for the taxi industry in South Africa, it's very low on, on terms of, 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 and it's not a reflection of the amount of money moving through those businesses. It's cash, it's undeclared. And I think that's a problem. Um, I don't think they're paying their fair share in tax and uh, and and revenue uh, tax. And I think that it's it's an outrage. But nobody wants to tackle them because they get away with things. And I think the more examples we set around the country, like Cape Town set, 
that, sorry, you won't behave above the law. You won't come into meetings with machine guns and you will abide by the law um, if you want to negotiate. I think those, you know, the, the better it'll be. Um, I think they've got a, a culture of impunity precisely because people are too scared to take them on and tackle them. I was just about to say, are you scared of them? Because, I mean, we saw they just shut down the whole city. They can do what they want, when they want, and it seems like there's very little consequences. I mean, I know several of them got arrested, taxis were impounded, but when I looked at the footage, right, of people walking from uh, Cape Town CBD to Kai Leacher, yeah. Yeah. walking home after a full day's work, I mean, how... Do you avoid that? And yeah. are you scared of them? Well, I'm not scared of them. Um, and I think that nobody in the country should be scared um, of any uh, organization that behaves outside the law because there should be a consequence for that. Look, they lost a lot of revenue over those days as well. Let's not forget that. Uh, to go four or five days without takings when you've got taxis to keep on the road is significant. And I think that you know they realized that that was – it was going to hurt them more in the long run if they carried on with this than, than not, which is why they folded for the same deal that was made you know, right at the beginning of the process by the mayor and the premier, as they were losing revenue. But had the city buckled on day one, I think it would have set a terrible precedent because then the next time there's something that a law that needs to be upheld, they then just say, well, you know, we'll just trash, destroy, break, and then you're not in the realm of the rule of law, you're in the realm of the law of the jungle. And whoever can you know, raise the biggest army, whoever can cause the most destruction is the person who wins out at the end of the day. And I think that would be a terrible thing for South Africa. And do you see yourself as president one day? Um, I've said already, uh, right from the beginning of this process, that this isn't about making me the president or the DA the president. And we've been very open that right from the beginning, that we must choose a presidential candidate who can maximize the number of votes that we'll be able to get. And it could be somebody who's not currently in frontline politics. Um, it could be somebody who's in one of the other parties. And we've made that very, very clear. And I'm sure that as the year progresses, we will announce um, somebody who I think would be a pretty a good candidate to be able to really set out that offer. And But that'll be up to the up to the charter to decide on, on that way forward. I have, however, said that the largest party must be the leader of government business. And precisely for how we started this podcast, the president's big fault is that he didn't legislate his reforms. You're going to have to get a pretty quick reform agenda through parliament in the first year of office if you're going to fix things over the five-year term, like unemployment, like education, like uh, policing, you're going to have to drive those reforms through Parliament. So you're going to need the largest party uh, in the uh, in the in the grouping to be able to help drive that legislation through. I don't know if you really answered it though, do, mm. but do you see yourself as president? Do you think you would be well, a I good think president? I could do the job. Um, certainly, and I mean, you're the leader of the uh, DA, so yeah, you would uh, be president. No, that's that's not the case. Um, the DA is not going to get 51 percent in the next election. I mean, I'd be. I'd be ki I'd be kidding you today if say we go from 22 to 51 percent in a single election. We're only going to do it through a coalition, um, which is what partly why we've set about determinedly putting the moonshot pact mm. together. Um, and as part of that, it's saying, well, we're not going to dominate and insist on the presidency. Um, but certainly, I, I, I do think I could do the job. Uh, I think you don't have to get up in the morning and start breathing to do a better <laughs> job than the current incumbent. Um, and certainly, you know, I think that where we've governed, we've been able to show that those alternative policies do work and they have brought jobs, safety, um, security, um, employment and more for, for many of the people who live there uh, where the DA's policies have been applied. And I just want to do a test, right? Mm. Because if you do become president, mm. I want to know for me, right? Mm. I don't care about anyone else. I want to mm. know for me if you're going to be competent mm. as president, right? Sure. So I'm going to I'm going to call this the Zuma test. Okay. <laughs> we all know that iconic clip of Zuma. I mean, I, I think it's happened several times, but him trying to read numbers. Yes. So give me but, a number, and I'm happy to read it. <laughs> so on the screen is a number. One. <laughs> okay. Pass that one with flying colors. Yeah. <laughs> let's let's uh. see. Here. Where's the decimal? There's no Where's decimals. Decimal? Um, that is... It's just one long number. 5,963,558. 
I think it's 59,634,558. Okay. And then this one. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. Looks like the test of the art chart. <laughs> The, 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 it's like pie or something. Yeah. Um, I mean, okay, that was that was just a bit of a goof. I, did, I didn't expect you to get I was about that one. To say, well, that's gonna you know, that's gonna take me a bit of time to, to work out. Yeah. Oh, we've got all day. I mean, yeah, yeah. go for. It. But I mean, I, I do want to talk about uh, service deliveries a little bit more, right? We mm. kind of talked about it a little bit earlier. But as I see, like in C point, a lot of people complain about. I call it clear view estate because mm. they've got the fence mm. around it. But it's a it's a settlement of homeless people, um, and gang members and addicts, right? That live in basically by the tennis courts within a fenced in area mm -hmm. in Seapoint, right? And it's the same thing like in Danoon, there's this new section of Danoon where there are probably tens of thousands of people living there or around 10,000. I'm not sure the exact numbers, but where are they supposed to go? Well, the problem is that they, because of the rapid urbanization in South Africa and particularly the fact that places like Cape Town and the Western Cape are victims of its own success. People want to be here. Precisely because you don't have to stand in a sasa queue in the blazing sun or the pouring rain. Every sasa point has got cover and shelter that people know that they've got a better chance of finding a job here. But the problem is with a rapid urbanization, even with the best will in the world, if the city spent its entire budget on housing every year, you would not be able to facilitate um, houses for every single person at the rate at which the urbanization is taking place. I live in Seapoint, so I live just down the road from that very, so you know all about that it, very yeah. place that, you, that you're talking about. And it's not ideal, and the city is fighting an ongoing battle with the Western Cape High Court uh, who, don't, you know, who rule against the city being able to move people along. When the city does enforce bylaws, often those go to the courts and the judges in the Western Cape High mm. Court you know, punish the city for, for trying to implement its own bylaws. But here's the thing. What you have to do is to do what the city is doing which is, and the province in partnership, which is developing housing opportunities close to the urban centre. It's no use the model that and perpetuating the apartheid model of building places on the outskirts of, of the urban edge. You need – people want to live and work in – in the urban area because it reduces the cost of Travel. transport yeah. and it also means that they have better access to services. Well-located public land within the urban edge is is going to be the, the answer to the problem. I just want to talk a little bit about, about the clear view there because people say what is, what is the city doing about it? Well, the city pays a large amount of money, everything more than any other metro in the country to – partner with shelters to be able to take homeless people off the streets. And Kulenborg 1, 2, 3, and 4, which are in the city centre under bridges, provide precisely accommodation for, for people free of charge. The only thing is you're not allowed to use drugs and alcohol in the facility. Every single person on the street is documented and has a social worker working with them to try and clean them up, repatriate them, get them back into into mainstream society, and I think that, that that is the way to go. But, you know, this is a problem that that uh, metropolitan areas the world over are grappling with. I mean, even Paris, uh, London, uh, homelessness is on the increase. And um, it's not something that's going to go away anytime soon, but I'm very happy that, that we have the solutions to those problems. And, yes, I'm sure it's frustrating for residents to drive past the clear view, but... The city is doing everything it can. When I look at the CBD, I know you say there's a huge influx of people coming to Cape Town, right? And the Western Cape. I mean, there's so many more homeless people than there were five years ago or 10 years ago. Mm. I don't know what the numbers are, but it's, I mean, it must be in the thousands, right? Um, what can be done about that? I, I, I just don't see a solution because a lot of them, right, are addicts or mentally ill people. Um, and I know a lot of people say, oh, put them somewhere else. It is, it's just going to become someone else's problem, right? What can be done for, for vulnerable people living on the street? I mean, I see guys walking around. I, I had a, a conversation with a homeless man a few months ago, and he thought he was Xi Jinping, the emperor of China, and he, he was best friends with Putin, right? Yeah. Uh, and he was going to start the next dynasty. I mean, and this guy's just living on the streets. Mm -hmm. What can be done about that? Because you can't put them into homeless shelters and a lot of them probably just end up getting sent to prison. Yeah, well, this is a tragedy about the about the system and about how mental health is dealt with in South Africa. 
um, and the fact that we have a massive shortage of social workers uh, in the social welfare department who should be dealing with cases exactly like this. I mean, I've met the full range from Lady Dyer to precisely the people you're speaking to who you know, are clearly mentally unstable and belong in a facility that can care for somebody like that where they're getting the treatment that they need. And the problem is, is that these individuals are taken to hospitals. There's no facilities for them, so they're just released back onto the streets again. Um, Falkenberg is is generally quite full, and you know they don't want to take on long term patients there. Uh, and until we start to grapple with mental health as a as a genuine issue in South Africa, and we start to put money and social workers behind dealing with the problem. It's not going to get better, and that is the reality. It's just not going to get better. I think um, when it comes to dealing with like the, the problem we have with so many homeless people on the streets and people suffering from addiction and mental illness, you know, um, like you say, I think there are so many organizations that are trying to do stuff to help, but the problem is that there's just you, – you, you can't keep up, mm-hmm. right? There's not enough people in positions to do good mm-hmm. um, and make that kind of a change. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a famous saying, you know, how do you solve a beach full of beach starfish, you know, one at a time? And you just got to keep doing it and you just got to keep working at it. And it is frustrating and I understand why people get frustrated. And um, You're paying your yeah. rates as a citizen in the city and you've got to drive past Clearview. It makes you unhappy and – and it really For me, it makes me angry. Yeah. Not because they're there, because they shouldn't be there in the first place, yeah. right? Um, I think they should stay there because for me, it's a, it's like right in your mm. face. You can't hide it on the outskirts anymore. Now it's coming to the city, mm. right? Something needs to be done. Yeah. And it's not put them somewhere else. It's find solutions to reform these people and give them the opportunities to start a better life. Yeah. You know? That's why the social welfare the model is the right one to go through because it's not a it's not a criminal justice problem. It is a social welfare problem. And we must locate the problem where it is best to be addressed. I did a project um, about two or three years ago, right? And uh, it was called Unfiltered. Um, and I went and documented this dam in Danoon. I don't know if you've ever seen the dam, mm-hmm. right? So it's right at the back of Danoon, but it's alongside the, the highway. And um, this for me is like mm-hmm. the clearest example of things not happening in certain areas, right? Because this dam has been there. They say it's never, ever been cleaned. I'll show you some footage that I took. And it was actually, I risked my life going there because mm-hmm. I went in it. Um, you'll, you'll see here. So this is a little dam literally right at the, back of of the noon right you can see it right there and you can see all the trash is being thrown in there so it's basically like a a big toilet because that's where nappies go that's me in a canoe in the middle of the the trash right and i've heard that there are dead bodies in there because sure. people uh, if people have abortions they will get rid of the bodies there or if there's township justice they will throw the bodies there as well right so, I mean, that was me in a 500 rand canoe that was leaking everywhere. <laughs> and um, this was uh, this is footage that's unrelated, but this was literally the same day I was there. There was a fire in the township as well, right? But you see two things there that you don't see in other cities. You see fire the fire engine. department yeah, there. Yeah, I was just about to say, you. <laughs> yeah. which is, you know, far more than you can say for what happened in downtown Joburg. And, you know, obviously it's, it's important. Look, I don't know uh, what the what the circumstance of the dam is. I don't know whether it's a privately owned piece of land or whether it's city land. It's it's city land. It's part of the main section mm. of Danoon. And that's mm. the reason I wanted to bring it up because I've posted about this dam mm. for, I mean, several years now. And the clips have gone, I mean, some of the clips mm. have been seen all over the world. Uh, but the dam is still there and it's still dirty. And it is yeah. such a safety hazard. Every time I go there, I see dying animals next to the dam. I saw a dog literally die while I was there. People have told me that there are literally dead bodies in that dam. Crimes that have not been solved, right? Yeah. Why is that still there? I can't answer. I mean, I, I'll have to find out from the city why that is the case. But I'm sure there is an explanation because, I mean, the mayor has taken a very strong line on cleaning up and, and cleaning out and doing uh, suburban cleanups, township cleanups, etc. 
Uh, there will be a reason for it, but what that reason is, I can't tell you, but I'm willing to find out for you. And, Please, and, and I would really know. love that. And I, I bring uh, this up just because you could just I'm... send me the footage and I can pass I would it love to, to the that. city and, and find out what, what the story is there. I, I'm not convinced it's city land, but we, let's have a look and, 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 and see. Okay. I'll get the earth numbers and, and have a but look. But either way, someone has to clean that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and that's just a very small example. In a, yeah. you know, yeah, I mean, it looks like a quarry of some sort that, that sort of filled up. Uh, try to go back. It, it, it is a quarry. Yeah. but it's So it's in the main section of Danoon where, um, I mean, there's kids that go play there. And uh, yeah, it looks like a quarry of some sort um, that was used to quarry stone. At one point, it must yeah. have had a use, but now it's, I mean, there's yeah. surfboards in there, there's everything in there. Um, yeah, no, it doesn't look very good at all. No. Mm. And I, I bring it up to you just because I thought this was a good opportunity mm. to get something done. Yeah. And I've really, I mean, people have talked about going and, and cleaning it up mm. when I posted the video, but this is not something that people can do. No, This is something that the government needs to do. It needs some machinery. This is extremely dangerous, mm. extremely dangerous. I mean, that water must be so toxic. Yeah. Well, I will get to the bottom of it and find out exactly <laughs> what the story is. Cool. Uh, but I won't be going in the canoe anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, I just did that for the visual representation. And for the people that are, are listening, I'm showing them clips yeah. of, a, of a dirty dam that's in the yeah. center of a township in, yeah. in Cape Town. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I also want to know, how do you feel about the conditions in places like the Cape Flats? They're not great. And, you know, they've. They, it's not you know, a great environment to live in. Um, but certainly, you know, it's not our vision that people would live in those conditions for the rest of their lives. And, you know, that is why we're building more housing opportunities. We're creating more well-located land close to the city center so that people are able to to graduate out of places like that into starter homes, into subsidized housing, into rent to buy and to freehold uh, properties. Uh, that is the model uh, that's going to have to be used. But for for now, you know, that is the that is the reality. Just as is, is the reality in Sao Paulo and Brazil. Just as the reality in Calcutta, Delhi, uh, Mumbai. Uh, just as it's a reality in yeah. in any one of those of those countries that have those types of of situations where you have rapid urbanization and massive unemployment, uh, and people flock to urban areas to to try and find opportunities and what i mean in terms of <laughs> i know i know that gangs are very prominent in those areas right and i go there a lot and I, and I always talk about it on the podcast because i feel that it's really important to speak about because i i think no one really does or very few people do because it's so normal right someone gets killed there um it doesn't really end up on the news mm. because it happens so often but if someone was killed say in this area it would be a big headline Right. Um, what can be done about the the drug problem and the gangs problem in those areas? Well, remember the the genesis of this problem was the disbanding of specialized units. You used to have uh, gang units within the SAPS, and I want to just ma make it very clear because this is where a lot of people start to cross their wires. Policing and safety and security is a national government responsibility. We have a national police system in South Africa. Um, and part of the reason we're fighting for devolution so hard is to get provincial and local government more policing powers. With the disbandment of those specialized units, the Narcotics Bureau and the, uh, and the gang's units, you ended up then without a, a focus on it. The reality is you'll never beat gangsterism and drugs unless you have an intelligence-driven operation. Yes, you can do the bobby on the beat and do the raids from time to time, uh, and yes, you will take drugs off the street. But the reality is that unless you have intelligence-driven mm. operation, you're never going to get on top of the gang problem. You're never going to get hold of, hang on, hold of the drug problem. Now, let me talk again why I think devolution is so important. We have a national police plan that hammers the square peg of national policing into the round holes of different provinces and just bangs it in. But the problems facing the Western Cape are very different to the problems facing the Northern Cape. And the problems facing KwaZulu-Natal are very different to Limpopo. Let me use an example here. So I a police service and don't believe that poaching is a priority, Perlimun poaching. What they don't realize is that the Perlimun poaching industry is intrinsically linked to the guns, uh, the drugs industry, which is intrinsically linked to the firearms industry and linked to gangsterism. 
there's a chain there. It's all linked, so yeah. So if you don't deal with the one section, you're not going to be able to deal with the rest of the chain. And that's why the provinces now have to step in with an anti-poaching unit to try and stop the parliament poaching because if you can do that, you can stymie the drug in, the, the drug trade in, uh, in, in the Western Cape. And this is precisely why we need to have, I believe, more provincialized policing services that can focus on those more relentlessly. And it's also why the Metro Police under J.P. Smith have introduced the gangs unit in the Metro Police to try to get to grips with gang-related violence and to try and use smart technology, drones, um, intelligence, being able to track cell phones, being able to track um, you know, the movements of, of well-known gangsters to try and combat crime. But the reality is, just as in Chicago in the 60s and New York in the late 70s and eight, early 80s, you won't beat the, the gang and drug problem unless you have intelligence-driven operations that goes after not the runner on the street, but the kingpin sitting behind all of these uh, all of these gangs. That's for the people. That, those are the people that you've got to go after, and many of them are politically protected. Many of them pay off the police. I was very tragic going on a raid one evening with the Metro Police, and they'd taken a <coughs> excuse me a thirty-eight special revolver, silver one off one of the gangsters. And I said to the guy, you must be so pleased. He said, I would be, but this is the fifth time I've taken this gun off From the him. streets. Oh. Or not off the streets. Yeah. Guns are going into the file 13. And going straight back They're out. They're going straight, sold back by SAPS. And, I mean, this is no longer a matter of speculation. It's been proven, and it's a huge problem, um, which is why giving the province more control over the policing service is going to be able to, I think, massively solve uh, solve this issue. But going after the runners the small fry, and leaving the whales, well, the, the runners are easily replaced. Speaking about this, right, like I hear a lot of the solutions you're giving, I find are we must uh, take down the kingpin mm. or we must stop the crime, right? Correct. Uh, or we must um, intercept this one so that doesn't get there. But for me, it's not really about like... I don't think taking out the kingpin will do anything. I don't think policing it heavily will do anything, right? Because mm. there will always be corruption there. With me, I think the solutions are um, working with the kids, right? And and changing the next generation so that it doesn't mm. keep happening. Right? It's so it's easy to, to but do a, a raid or take down this this guy, right? I'm an uh, I'm a recovering addict, mm. um, and I've I suffered from addiction from mm. quite an early age, and I know an addict. Uh, or a dealer uh, or a criminal will always do find a way, right? They'll always find a way to get, you can stop this this delivery, but another one will come. You can take the kingpin out, another one will be will, will take his place, right? What can you do for the next generation to make sure that they don't fall into those traps mm. and you stop it from the ground roots? You don't stop it, you don't try and cut, cut off the head and then another one grows. You, you start by the feet and build it up, you know? How do you do that? So I don't think it's an either or. I think it's an and. I think you can do both. Yeah. Um, I think that if one looks how the gangs were beaten in Chicago and New York, it was by decapitation. Gambino family, um, the um, you know the Lucky Lucianos of the world. It was through Al Capones. It was through targeting of of those individuals and removing them that that decapitated those organizations, created instability within them, and then they fell apart. But the, the social side of it is also important, and, and you're right, it does start in the schools. And that was one of the reasons why the Western Cape has these after-school programs where they create facilities for children to go after school to either do recreational activity or to do their homework just in a safe space where – they're not then influenced by drug dealers and and the like. But again, I come back to the point. Mm. We have a massive shortage of social workers in this country. You know, drug problems require social work. Uh, it's, it's not, again, the criminal justice system is not going to help an addict. Um, you know, you can jail an addict as much as you like. It's not going to get them off the, you know, off whatever they're addicted to. No, especially Plus, in our prisons yeah, where it, well, people I mean, have drugs in prisons, yeah. have cell phones in prisons and can keep yeah. doing criminal well, activities I mean, in prison. you can bring a dead body into a prison these days and set it alight as we what, saw. What do you mean? Well, that famous case uh, of... Can you tell Tarbo, me about Tarbo it? Bester, that uh, oh. they escaped, he escaped out of jail by bringing, they smuggled in a dead body. And burnt it to the in the cell and they thought it was him and while well, he escaped. Um, yeah, so... 
yeah, I mean, our prisons are also, and I mean, that's a whole new conversation. Yeah, of course, well, because yeah. I don't believe our prisons are um, are rehabilitatory in their nature. I think they become universities of crime, and children go in for minor offences and come out, you know, ready to commit harder offences. For sure. Um, but again, I come back to the point that we have social problems in South Africa, and you can trace it back to many, many things. But unless we get social work done and have a social welfare department that has the manpower and ability to be able to reach into these communities, it's very, very difficult. A school teacher is not going to be able to solve, you know, a domestic problem at home, um, you know, in a broken household. Uh, you know, their job is to teach. It requires social welfare to be triggered. And this is what how other countries work. When there's a domestic problem or they pick something up in the school, the system works because there's an alert then that goes out to the social welfare department in that particular area. And that social welfare department then opens a case and goes and investigates it. And if there's drug abuse, drug addiction, there's treatment clinics that people are then going to. So you've got a system, a, a whole ecosystem of problem resolution. In South Africa, I mean, you've got teachers that, that they won't be able to do that. You, social welfare workers that are so overworked and, and underpaid that, I mean, there's just no way they can carry another case. And we don't have the facilities. I said mental health facilities and treatment facilities for people who are, who are addicts. And, mm -hmm. and I'm talking here particularly uh, people on the lower income levels. I mean, you're probably very lucky. You've got parents and a family that cared for you and Definitely, probably had yeah. means that you could go to a facility. We don't have facilities for the lower um, lower um, income groups. Um, people who don't have medical aid. Where do they go? What what facility are they taken to um, to to beat that addiction? It's it's a it's a, it's a huge problem in South Africa. Mm. And it's one that has to be has to be worked through. I think we've laid decent foundations in in some of these uh, areas, right? Um, I mean, we've got amazing teachers. We've got amazing hospitals, mm. right? But at the same time, like mm. with the hospitals, not enough doctors, schools, not enough teachers. Mm. And it's a big problem with people leaving South Africa. I mean, there's back in Danoon, right? I always go to Danoon because that's where um, someone I know lives. Mm. Um, I went to the schools there to do some work and there was one teacher for like four classrooms. Mm. How do you stop professionals and doctors and teachers from leaving and going somewhere else? By creating an opportunity economy where people stay. People will always be where opportunity exists. The moment people see a lack of opportunity or their career prospects being limited on the basis of the color of their skin or you know, the language they speak, they're going to find opportunity elsewhere. And particularly skilled people um, who are in demand will always find opportunity. And that's why we've got to you know, understand what the push and pull factors are for excellence uh, in South Africa and and focus on those. Crime is a big deterrent for professionals. They don't want to live or work in an unsafe environment. Um, you know, a, a triple B, double E is a big deterrent to people who don't want to be judged on the color of their skin. They want to be able to be judged on how they work and what they bring. And, you know, I think we've got far too many push factors that are prevailing in South Africa and not enough pull factors. How do you attract excellence? Well, you don't do it by having a draconian visa regime uh, where you can't even bring in critical skills. You don't have it where you make this such an unattractive investment environment with no electricity, no running water, none of that. You, you know, you, you're you not going to attract investment into an environment like that. And so opportunity, uh, w w um, professional people always go where opportunity is. And that's why we've got to turn South Africa into an opportunity economy again, where people see this as a country on the up and up. They see they want to be part of this. And we have history. so much potential. No, I, mean, that that I love the, South Africa, yeah. right? I love the people here. There is nowhere on earth like it. I've been to several places. There's nothing like it. But it just scares me coming from Zimbabwe. I've seen where it goes. And I mean, I landed in Joburg the other day for a wedding. Um, and... I saw that there was a, that I met the rabbi that was mm. officiating the wedding. And he said, how was your, your flight? You're enjoying being in Joburg. And I said, you know, when I landed here, I thought mm. it was Zimbabwe. Mm. Well, exactly. And I mean, Joburg does resemble Harare in the, in the early 90s. You know, everything for sale, no buyers, um, definitely not a city. Derelict houses everywhere. Derelict houses and people leaving now in droves for, for other parts of the country and other parts of the world. 
But this is what happens when you have a city being run by a man who got less than 1% of the vote in, in the city. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be like that. Joburg should be at the epicenter of economic growth, regeneration and development. But the instability in that city um, for the last eight years has made it virtually impossible for any government to get stuck in there and, and fix things. So you make progress and then you get voted out in emotional no confidence because someone like Gayton McKenzie decides he's going to get an extra seat from the ANC, collapses the government, they put the Sky Guamanda in charge and the city's roads are literally blowing up every... Gayton every... McKenzie was a bank robber, wasn't he? Oh, he, he was a criminal originally. He was a bank robber and he, and he served his time. Uh, and I'm less worried about his past than his present misdemeanors. And I mean, he's really causing havoc at local government level. Uh, Nasna, <clears throat> which he was in coalition, is bankrupt. Beaufort West was supposed to be turned into the Dubai in the desert. Um, there was a huge fundraiser they had in Johannesburg. The Dubai in the desert. They probably put like a little monopoly house there and now it cost $20 million <laughs> or something. <laughs> they had a big fundraiser in Joburg. They raised millions of rands. It was ostensibly for the use in turning Beaufort West to the Dubai in the desert. Well, no one knows where that money's gone. Um, Gayton's skipped town in Beaufort West and now gone to Joburg. Um, and it's it's a disaster. There's cater deployment in the departments they run in uh, in Johannesburg. So it's very difficult to to transform local government when you've got that instability. And that's part of the reason why we're focusing on the Moonshot Pact. A large part of that instability was that there was no plan. And that's why I said in April, let's use the time now between now and the election to iron out any differences, to come up with plans and alternatives so that if we get in, we know immediately from day one what we need to be doing and who's going to be doing it. Um, so we don't end up with that same chaotic system we've seen in Johannesburg mm -hmm. playing out at a national or provincial level. The last thing I want to do is um, I got a, a bunch of questions from the audience. Whenever yeah. I have guests on, um, I, I usually post a story on Instagram. Josh Wide Awake, by the way. Mm -hmm. And what's your, what's your name on Instagram? Um, at Jay Steenhazen. At Jay Steenhazen. So go follow him. But uh, mm -hmm. also before the podcast, I often ask people to send in questions, sure. right? So there's a few questions here and... Um, the, the first one is, can you please explain what BRICS is and how it will impact South Africa? So BRICS is a, a grouping of countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, which is ostensibly trying to create a new uh, trading block of, of countries um, because they want to what they call uh, rebalance the, the deficit. They essentially in opposition to the Western alliances um, and the reality is that South Africa is a very small player in all of it. Our economy is the smallest out of all of the countries. And we don't really derive much benefits from BRICS. 77% of South Africa's foreign direct investment comes from the US, the UK and the European Union. We have bilateral agreements with the European Union and the United Kingdom. We have a unilateral agreement called AGOA with the United States, which gives us um, duty-free market access to the American market with no reciprocity in ours is hugely beneficial, uh, which means we can import, uh, export BMW X3s into the US cheaper than they can manufacture them in the US plant of Spartanburg. Massive advantage. We don't have a single bilateral agreement with any of the BRICS countries. So that's more of an ideological thing than an economic sense thing. And we compete with Russia um, for uh, in, in the market for uh, rare earth and minerals. Um, and it doesn't make much sense for us to to be doing that in opposition to our trading partners where we are responsible for the bulk of our foreign direct investment and where we have access to the markets. I think also Russia is using it as a way to try and create a friendlier environment for themselves um, as they are being isolated by the rest of the world because mm. of the invasion with Ukraine. The other worry now is that Two of the new countries that have been added to the BRICS system, um, Saudi Arabia and, yeah. United Arab uh, and, Arab Emirates. and Iran, Iran sorry. are countries that don't share the same values and principles as South Africa. They are no women's rights there. The LGBTQI community are discriminated against in those countries. They don't believe in women's rights to vote or participate in the daily affairs of them. And you know, I worry that we're aligning ourselves with countries that don't share the values and principles that we hold dear in our constitution and which could harm us later down the line. And how do you feel about Cyril cozying up to, I mean, people like Putin? 
Well, he's doing it for a simple reason, and it's got nothing to do with what's in the best interest of South Africa. It's what's in the best interest of the ANC. The single largest donor to the ANC is a Putin-linked oligarch, Victor Vexelberg, who runs a manganese mine in the Northern uh, Cape in partnership with Chancellor House. And and that's just what we know about. I have no doubt there's large amounts of Russian funding finding its way into ANC coffers um, to support them. We know Russia meddles in the democratic elections of other countries, and I have no doubt they are providing assistance to the ANC in this country. And that's why the president refuses to take a hard line on the um, invasion of, of Ukraine and why he refuses to uh, stop cozying up to Russia and why he whitewashed the Lady R report and why uh, we're continuously doing war games with the Russian army off the coast of Durban. Uh, all of these things are very detrimental to our relationships with our large trading partners and the people who invest in our economy and who allow us access to their markets. And you know, it's a dangerous game and the president's going to get his fingers burnt if he carries on down this road. The next question from someone in the audience was, uh, why has marijuana been legalized in South Africa? And um, what benefits will it have on the country, if any? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think that um, part of the reason it's been uh, it's been legalized for personal use is the fact that it's become impossible to enforce and to police. Um, in the past, you'd have to put a lot of policing resources to go after you know people who were found in clubs with marijuana and clogged up the court systems, etc. It was felt that uh, it is a less harmful drug than some of the others, but there's also some commercial benefits from the from um, from marijuana that South Africa could be exporting around to the rest of the world. Uh, there's byproducts of of marijuana itself, and places like the Eastern Cape have a very depressed economy, and KwaZulu Natal also with a depressed rural economy could be using those uh, access to world trade on those byproducts. Um, to to create opportunities and jobs in the country. There is a concern about the gateway, uh, whether it is a gateway drug into into more serious drugs, and uh, there's been studies both ways on that. However, I think when the decision was made to, to legalise personal use of it, it was mainly done because it's now become virtually impossible to, to police. Well, people will, like I say, mm. people will find a way no matter what. Whether it's legal or illegal, people mm. will do what they want mm. in a way, Right. Um, and with marijuana, I find because it's illegal, it's seen mm. as really bad. And I, I'm not here to f defend anything, mm. but I find it a bit hypocritical when people go, oh, marijuana is a gateway mm. drug, right? But alcohol is not. I mean, correct. And, uh, and cigarettes as well. And cigarettes and Tobacco. vapes. And, and how many lives has alcohol ruined? Mm. I mean, uh, absolutely. What are the what are the death rate yeah. for but marijuana again, users? You know, this comes you know? down to to a political philosophy. Yeah. And I'm a liberal, um, and I'm in the liberal, not in the American sense of the word, but in the traditional liberal sense of the word. And I believe it's up to people's personal choice about what they to do. To do what they want. You know, that's why Within I don't reason. believe in, in liquor trading hours. I don't believe in making a government making personal decisions for people about tobacco, which is why we will oppose Zol. new tobacco <laughs> and tobacco bill. You know, I'm, I think that people have and must have agency to make decisions for themselves, and provided those decisions don't impact or impugn other people's rights and responsibilities, exactly. you know, people must be free to be who they want to be and to make their own life choices. But it's, it's um, also safer, right? Because now you can get them from credible people. Yeah, but it's also like the liquor trading hours. I mean, it doesn't make sense to me. So I can I can go to a illegal shabine, or I can go to a restaurant at eight in the morning and I can order four double vodkas and I can get absolutely off my head, but I'm not allowed before 11 o'clock to go and buy a bottle of Chardonnay for, for lunch. It just doesn't make sense to me. And I think that when we get into this Calvinistic, draconian, um, legis trying to legislate people's behavior, uh, it's, a, it's a slippery slope. And that's how you end up with, like we had in COVID, where you were being legislated about whether you could buy Crocs and yeah. T-shirts and whether you could buy cooked chickens or not. And we must be very careful about opening the door for government to start legislating about people's personal choices. Um, you know, and, and I think I think that people, as a liberal, I believe people are best able to make their own decisions 
about about their future and about what they do and they should be left alone to do so provided mm-hmm. they don't harm or impinge on other yeah. people's rights. And I want to ask you this question. You, you can just say uh, no comment if you don't want to comment, but have you ever smoked weed? Yes, of course. <laughs> of course, I love that. Yeah, no, of course. Are you an avid smoker? Or? No, not at all. Actually, I don't smoke cigarettes at all. But, you know, there's people who would say, well, I've never smoked marijuana. I, I have smoked marijuana before. I didn't like it. Um, I don't use it. I wouldn't encourage it. Did you only do it once? Yes. Or? And, and, <laughs> Can you yeah, tell me the story? Uh, well, I, it was so long ago. It was like, I think, first year varsity um, where, you know, these things uh, become the rage. But, I mean, I don't enjoy it. I don't smoke cigarettes or vape. So, you know, the, just the whole concept of it uh, didn't mm. appeal to me. Um, but, yeah, I mean, uh, but I'm certainly not going to, you know, be – a moralist about whether other people should use it. I'm certainly yeah. not going to sit here and say I smoke, I puff, but I didn't inhale. I'm being, <laughs> being dishonest, and I, I think that you yeah. want politicians to be honest with you. That's about, it. Yeah, about what they've what they've. I'm done. S- I'm so sick of hearing politicians just <laughs> bat what people want to mm-hmm. hear, like what they want to hear. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and with you, I, I really do get kind of a genuine vibe. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing to thank. It's just you. <laughs> but um, I wanted to play one voice note, right? Mm. So one of my friends, his name is uh, Ronnie Coleman. Uh, he wanted to send a voice note. I actually haven't listened to it yet. Oh, well, that's a bit dangerous. Yeah, no, no, I might, I'm not gonna, anything. No, no, I've, li- I've listened to a bunch of his <laughs> okay. uh, voice notes already. Okay. But uh, he wanted to s- basically say something, and I'll okay. just play it. Um, Connie Coleman. Uh, Ronnie Coleman. Ronnie Coleman. Yeah. Okay. Very, very smart guy. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to let this play and okay. we can cut it out if it's, if, if it's wild. Okay. <laughs> Many South Africans feel as if the DA's adoption of a policy of non-racialism communicates that the effects of apartheid, that the DA believes the effects of apartheid no longer shape the South African landscape today. Because those policies and those harms were done along racial lines, but the DA no longer desires to govern or policy or implement policies along racial lines to redress those harms. So does the DA believe that the harms of apartheid no longer affect contemporary South Africans? As someone who lives in Cape Town, in the southern suburbs, in Kenilworth and Harfield Village, in a place where forced removals were done up until the mid-1980s, as someone who has been lucky enough to chat to many of the families who were forcibly removed and dispersed over the flats in the 1980s, those people are still alive today. How have we arrived in a place where we can adopt policies of non-racialism when those scars, those harms still exist today, still distinctly exist within our own city, the city that DA, that the DA wishes to hold up as a bastion of a South African ideal of a metropole. If he feels as if those policies of apartheid are no longer relevant to contemporary South Africa, what were the policies in democratic South Africa that were implemented, that alleviated, corrected, and let us forget the harm done under apartheid. Yeah, so I mean, first, first of all, he starts off with, uh, with a chronic misconception. First of all, let me be clear, non-racialism is not something the DA invented. It's enshrined in our constitution. The constitution calls South Africa to be a non-racial country. The ANC as well, notionally, in their preamble to their constitution, says that they believe in non-racialism. Non-racialism does not mean that you deny that there's, there's, a, there's a history. Non-racialism doesn't mean you're blind to color either. Non-racialism just says that we don't treat people in the country as envoys of their race and ascribe characteristics to them. So if you see a black person, they must be poor, they must be downtrodden, they must have uh, had a terrible education, and they must have, have, they must have no opportunity. And you know, or if I see a white person, they must be rich, they must be privileged. They must have come from you know a terrific home, and they must have had every opportunity possible. And the point of departure here is that we've had race-based policies being applied over the last thirty years to try and redress the ills of race-based policies. 
What have they achieved? Well, they've driven black unemployment up massively. They've meant that black households are now 10% poorer than they were 30 years ago than they are today. And they've seen nothing broad-based or empowering for the 30 million people who live trapped in poverty. So layering race-based policies over the ills of previous race-based policies is like you know treating a gunshot victim by shooting them again. Uh, you don't. You've got to do something different. And a good example is one he uses, uh, forced removals. By his analysis then and his his uh, proposals, uh, what have we done? Well, should we then go and evict all those people in Harfield Village and and make them victims of forced removal? Or do we do something different? And our view is that, that government has failed to bring in place broad-based empowerment policies. And I would encourage him really encourage him and others to go to the DA website, da.org.za, and read our economic justice policy. It starts with the problem statement of apartheid and what apartheid has done. But it says we're not going to address the ills of apartheid by perpetuating a reverse apartheid in South Africa. Secondly, race-based policies actually harm poor black South Africans more than anybody else in the country because, A, they're locked out of opportunity – B, the premium that is paid for price gouging to fulfill the requirements of triple BWE mean that the state has got less money to spend on the opportunity side of the economy, and I'll speak about that shortly. When you're paying 2,000 Rand for a household broom at Eskom and 800 Rand for a knee pad at Eskom, that's money that could be being spent on building schools and creating opportunities. So our view is that, you know, that people should not be seen as envoys of their race, that race-based policies – create more harm than good, and that if we really want to fix the, the problems of inequality in South Africa that Shlonis talks about, you've got to do it by focusing on the on the opportunity side of the equation. Mm. Government has spent the last 30 years on the outcomes side of the equation. They're trying to create an equality of outcome rather than equality of opportunity. What are the drivers of an equality of opportunity? First of all, excellent education, where it doesn't matter if you're a poor rural person or a rich urban person, you get a good quality education, health care that can provide for you, living in a, a decent home and a, a safe environment, being able to go to university, uh, being able to access jobs. Those are the, of the opportunity side of the economy, completely neglected by government over the last 30 years. And they've tried to now focus on creating an equality of outcome, where you're trying to now manage what comes out of the pipe. Whereas if you focus on what, what's going into the pipe and, and what's going to come out at the end, if you create that equality there, you've got less to manage on the outside of it. And that's precisely what our policy suite seeks to do. We also say that, you know, you don't need a proxy for disadvantage in South Africa. Is race a proxy for disadvantage? We say it's irrelevant because th- we have 30 million people living in poverty, 99.97% of them are black South Africans. If you focus your policies using poverty as the measure, then you're going to uplift precisely in a far more broad-based way those people who need help. And those are the people who need the help, not the you know, the rich billionaires who've got very wealthy of triple BWE and who keep being empowered while people in, in the 30 million pool get poorer and poorer every year. Focus your policies and your empowerment on those 30 million people. Lift them up. Yeah, there might be maybe you know, a comma something percent that are Indian and a comma something percent mm. that are white. But generally you'd be doing that without the price gouging and the beneficiation of people who are already empowered. And this is how many systems already work in the country. NISFIS, for example, is not based on race. Uh, it's based on 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 pure economics. Do you, What is the household income and do you qualify? The same with the SASA grant. It doesn't ask you what your race is to qualify. It says, what is your income? You know, Provide your SARS statement. If you fall below, below the threshold, you qualify for SASA. It doesn't matter what color you are. Mm. And that is how you create broad-based empowerment. Continuing down the road of of trying to, to manage things like triple B, double E, um, and to manipulate them in the way that, that this government is doing – is going to do even further harm to the economy. And the more money that is gouged out there, it's less money to put on the the opportunity side of the economy, which the world over shows that that is how you beat beat inequality. If race-based policies 
plain base-based policies were a driver of equality, why do we live in the most unequal society in the world still after 30 something years? Surely the inequality gap maybe not have, have gone, but surely it would have narrowed. Instead, it has widened. And now the biggest gap is between rich black South Africans and poor black South Africans. That's the biggest inequality gap that exists now in, uh, in the country. So race-based policies, I think, are, are regressive. And I don't think they genuinely help the the broad based number of people who really need help from from this government. And I think they create opportunities for corruption and manipulation. And when it comes to forced removals, right? You mentioned what is happening in places like District Six. Yeah. Well, District Six is tough because again, it's one something the cities wanted to get control of. It's owned by national government, the Department of Public Works, um, who have messed around for far too long. And it is a prime site where we could really... Because there's a lot of empty land there, yes, right? Exactly. And, and that a, land was previously owned by people what, and their places were demolished, what right? What a great site to build a, another Conradi, uh, another well-located piece of public land. And even the... Would, would, it, the, would it go back to the people that it was taken from? Though? Well, it should. And there's a, there's a whole process here. But those people have been messed around by national government for years and years and years and keep being made promises, but those promises are never met. But we would love to be able to get control of that piece of land because, man, we could really build a inclusionary housing, um, an inclusionary housing project there like Conradi um, and really you know, house a lot more people close to the CBD. There's plenty of vacant land there. But there's also a thing about redress. And this is the other thing. And you know, land claims are outstanding. At the current rate of, of land claim adjudication, it's going to take 30 years to adjudicate the land claims that are currently in the system. We put on the table in Parliament a proposal that would bring in retired judges and magistrates to sit in specialised courts to adjudicate land claims and accelerate them because we've got to close that chapter in South Africa. People who were arbitrarily dispossessed of land because of the colour of their skin require compensation. And where the land can't be provided back again, there should be an alternative, form either, of compensation, either, yeah. either financial or uh, or alternative land uh, or opportunity, and and that should be should be processed. But I mean, those land claims courts move at snail's pace, and many of the recipients or claimees have died waiting for justice still, and that is precisely why we put on the table that fast tracking process to be able to to give people land. and and. It's not rocket science. The government's got tons of land. Government is one of the largest landowners in the country. Should be the largest, no? Yeah, they've got the, they've got <laughs> tons and tons of, of of open, disused public land. Give people the land. Give them title and build on it. Uh, well, give them title. Mm. Give people title so that they've they've got a stake in something. Um, and yeah, you know, just it's, it's very very frustrating. But I really would encourage you to go and read the economic justice policy on our website because. It's not, as he says, that you're color blind. It just simply says you don't describe characteristics. And it has, using the sustainable development goals, a, a big focus on how we fix the economy side of, of the equation, which is really the, re the real drivers of inequality. Final question. Yeah. Right, I know you have to go. So um, what vision of hope do you have for young South Africans? You know, why should they stay here? Why shouldn't they go somewhere else where there's a... Uh, uh, a more stable future? Well, because this is a uh, the most fantastic place in the world. It really is. And there's so much opportunity here. There's stuff that is still to be done here that's been done millions of times over in many of those other economies. We have huge opportunities that are as unmined potential here. But young people need to be part of that journey going forward. They need to become the heroes in, in how we tap that opportunity. And one of those ways is by making sure that they vote. A lot of young people, there's 13 million people that are not registered to vote in South Africa. The majority of them are people between the ages of 18 and 35. They've checked out. They say politics is not, I'm not interested in politics. But the reality is that if anything this last two, three, two, four years have shown you is that you may not be interested in politics, but it's very interested in you. It can switch off the lights in your business. It can shut down opportunity. Uh, it can keep water you know, out of your home. It can you know, determine whether your side hustle succeeds or not. So you may not be interested in politics, but you better get interested because it affects every aspect of your life. And as young people, 
We should not be allowing other people, older people, to make decisions that are going to affect our future without us being part of that. It's not time to sit back and get complacent. No, this is not the time, and especially this next election. It's going to be a hinge of history election for South Africa. South Africa, and I think many international observers and local observers are watching very carefully what happens in next year's election. And for many, it's going to be a decision point about whether they stay or whether they go. And we need to make sure we push the hinge of history in the right direction. But we can only do that if we're registered to vote and that we're active citizens. Change doesn't happen by osmosis. It is an act of the will. It is getting registered. And it is so easy. You can do it online. It is so easy. You don't need to leave your home. You can do it online. Uh, uh, check.da.org.za, great website. It'll tell you whether you're registered or not. If you're not, it'll direct you immediately to the IEC website. You upload your ID document, you register, you're done. You can then vote next year. The power in this next election and this next year is going to lie with the registered. And young people need to rise up now and be part of that power. Uh, otherwise, you know, you're going to sit around complaining and moaning about things. But I'm sick and tired of complaining. Yeah, I do really something. am. Do something. Let's it's do an something. Act yeah. of the will. It's an act of the will. And, and young people need to be part of this new journey as we write South Africa's next chapter. John, thank you so much for coming down today. Thank you. And um, yeah, I really enjoyed this conversation. I think uh, it was very productive and please clean this stamp. Anyway, thank you everyone for watching this episode of the Wide Awake Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did and I'll see you all very soon. Cheers. Oh, 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 oh,